Now to CPAC, or the Conservative Political Action Conference. It wrapped up on Sunday. The theme, America Uncanceled, and among the speakers at CPAC, former HUD Secretary Dr. Ben Carson, and he joins us now by phone. And, and Dr. Carson, as you know, your comments are raising eyebrows, and I'll, I'll get to those in just a moment. But first, your former boss, Donald Trump, granting extensive interviews with Michael Wolff, the author, toward the end of his presidency. And Wolf is saying that Donald Trump has convinced himself that he won. And I'll, I'll begin with the simple question, did Donald Trump win? Well, I don't know that we'll ever know the answer to, to that question. Obviously, there were a lot of irregularities, and no one seems to be that interested in, in solving them. You know, if if the election results were legitimate, I would think that every it would be in everybody's interest to look at the evidence in an open way. Because we so, need Dr. To move Carson, on. can I offer an invitation to you? Uh, that I offer to everybody that says that um, there are now to date 66 lawsuits that have been filed, dismissed by the courts, two cases before the Supreme Court concerning the election, certified by Congress and including putting the rubber stamp on by his own vice president. If there is evidence out there, would you bring it forward for our show so that we could see it and come back on the air? Well, I believe that uh, there is a lot of work going on right now to bring it. The problem, of course, with so some of the other investigations but, uh, is that what they have done is just continue to count the same ballots over and over again without yeah, actually Yeah, but I want to make sure. Are, are you saying that Joe Biden is not the president? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying if we were smart as a nation, instead of trying to dodge and, and blame each other, we would just say, let's have an open assessment that we can all agree is an open assessment and let's look at the data and if the data says so, he won, let's move on so let me ask you this um, there's another growing debate in Republican circles as to what happened on January 6th a congressman from Georgia says that what we saw on January 6th the insurrection was a normal tour group in Washington do you agree well, what we saw was a bunch of people who had pre-planned, you know, an attack, and that was wrong. There's no question about that. Other people just got caught up in it. But, uh, you know, I think it was a horrible thing. I think all of the insurrections and all of the destruction that goes on in our country is bad, and we shouldn't tolerate it. Why didn't you resign? We now know that six white supremacy groups were involved in that attack. People like the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, they don't like black folk. They don't like you and me. When you saw them storming the Capitol, why didn't you go into the White House immediately and, and issue your resignation? Because I have a responsibility. There are millions of people who depend on the function of HUD to go on and not to be influenced by political things that are going on. You consider that to be a political thing going on? Yes, it was a political thing that was going on. And we can't, uh, you know, neglect the needs of, of people who need housing and care uh, while we get involved in things of that nature. So let me ask you another question. Um, you're a man best known for being a brain surgeon, a physician, healing hands. Uh, I have a copy of your book. I want you to comment on something that Dr. Deborah Burke said, and she led the coronavirus task force. She said that because of the inaction on the Trump administration's part, as many as 400,000 lives were needlessly lost. As someone who made their living wearing a mask, did you go to the president and say, hey, these things stop the spread of germs. I wear a mask when I do brain surgery. People could wear a mask and actually save lives. Did you do that? Uh, no, I did not. And I have many other things that uh, were much more pressing than that. But the fact of the matter is the whole mask issue uh, it kind of diverts away from what we really need to be talking about. What we need to be talking about is are there cures, are there uh, understandings that are helping us to be able to deal with this disease, and are there ways that we can accelerate the process of getting it under control? The fact of the matter is it is largely under control now uh, because of the vaccines, and that was a tremendous effort on the behalf of many people to get that done. I don't think it's constructive to sit around and say, uh, 
you were the one who was responsible, or you were the one who was responsible. You get the credit. You get the credit. Forget no, about but, all but that. But what I'm asking, stuff. Dr. Carson, I'm, I'm asking on behalf of those 400,000 people that lost loved ones. I know people who lost loved ones. They want to know, did the administration do all it could do? They want to know as a physician, as someone who has led the cause in the health industry for decades, did you go into the White House and say, please stop this political posturing with masks? These things save lives, make people wear masks, or did you stay silent? Well, I'm not going to talk about what I talked about um, in confidential uh, ways, but I will say what was important to me was finding a cure and finding it quickly. And I spent a lot of time talking to a lot of people about how we get that done. I want to play your comments from CPAC in which you compared slavery to welfare. Take a listen. But what really had a negative impact was when the government came along and said, there, there, you poor little thing. I'm going to take care of all your needs. Dr. Carson, is that truly what you believe, that slavery was not as bad as welfare? I don't know where you would draw that conclusion. But basically what I'm saying so what do you is think? that the black community in the United States has withstood things that no other community could withstand. Slavery, Jim Crow, severe segregation, discrimination. And one of the reasons that they were able to withstand all of that is because they had strong family connections, strong sense of community, and faith in God. Along came the government and said, we will take care of you. We will take care of your needs. And as we begin to lose all of those factors, you know, our communities begin to disintegrate. That's what I'm saying. So, Dr. Carson, um, I remember when welfare began. Uh, you and I are roughly the same age. And I remember my father saying, we don't take welfare. And none of my friends took welfare. None of my friends took food stamps or any government benefits. And yet, most of my friends and myself have the aggregated wealth that is one-tenth that of white America. So if we weren't part of that system, why are we suffering the slings and arrows? Well, also remember that the black community in America possesses in wealth more than a trillion dollars. There are less than 15 countries that have that kind of wealth. And what we should be talking about, instead of being resentful, is how do we use that wealth in an appropriate way? How do we turn those dollars over in our own community two or three times before we send them out, the same way the Koreans and the Jews did, in order to create the kind of power and wealth that is necessary? That's what we need to be doing rather than fighting each other. That's not actually fighting each other. I, I agree with you. There's $1.4 trillion in black wealth in this country. Uh, I want to move on to another issue, though, that, that deals with the legacy of slavery, which is that black men are still treated in many cities like fugitive slaves. We just went through George Floyd. Are you convinced that George Floyd was a victim of that legacy of slavery? You know, the, the last year that we have good statistics on it is 2019. Uh, let me just ask you a question. How many black men, unarmed black men, were killed by white policemen that year? According to the Washington Post, it's as many as a thousand. The problem is the statistics are not kept, and that is one of the problems, and that is one of the things that they are trying to rectify in the George Floyd Policing Act. Okay, well, according to the Justice Department, the number is between 11 and 19, not thousands. So what we really need to be asking ourselves is how do we prevent things like that from happening? And, you know, there are a lot of things that have occurred technologically in terms of weaponry that the police can use that immobilize a person without taking their lives. Those are the kind of things we need to be talking about. How do we use those? Police are trained to use lethal force and there are other things that they could be doing. There could be more emphasis on police being in communities and knowing them. I was talking to a police officer in Baltimore. He said he walks through the same community every day. He knows everybody. Everybody knows him. He never has to buy lunch. It's a wonderful relationship. Those kinds of things make a difference. They develop trust. And 
you know, we need the police. There's no question about that. When I was a youngster, I spent a lot of time in the projects and in places. There were a lot of things going on that would have been exacerbated significantly right. without the presence of the police. So the very I read your book, and, and you're starting. Hurt. You sound you sound like you sound like Joe Biden actually more on that because he is is pretty much saying the same thing. Um, and also Eric Adams, the, the uh, Democratic nominee in, in uh, New York City, the former cop, is saying the same thing. But I want to get back to something that that broke just last night uh, concerning this Michael Wolff book. He said because the former president continues to maintain that he is still the president of the United States and that he was cheated, that he was duly elected, Michael Wolff rushed his book to print because he said he wanted to warn the American public that he does not think the former president is mentally fit. As a physician, as someone who deals with the brain, I'm concerned did you see signs that the former president might have been slipping? No, not at all. That's, that's absurd. And, uh, you know, people who spend their time talking about things like that really should be uh, focusing on how we solve our real problems. But, but, Dr. Carson, I have to push back on that, and I have to push back for this reason. Approximately 1,000 people stormed the Capitol on January 6th. 140 police officers were injured. Six people died. It was not a tourist group. It was an insurrection. I was there that day. I am among the people in the United States population, not as a journalist, but as an individual, as a citizen, who wants to know what happened, who was to blame. There are a lot of people like me that aren't ready to move on, and they question why people like you are so quick to move on. Well, first of all, there was only one person who was murdered that day, and we still don't know one the One person who was killed person. that day. Right. And her we name was Ashley name Babbitt. She was trying to break in through a window. It's on tape. We still don't know the name of the person who did that and have not had an investigation of that. But, you know, why should we even be concentrating on that? Why shouldn't we be concentrating on how we learn from those incidences and move forward? It was the wrong thing to do. There's, there's no one trying to hide that, I hope. It was not the correct thing. I haven't heard anybody who justifies that. However, the former president was on Fox News just this weekend saying it was a loving group of people welcome into the Capitol with open arms. Well, many of them were, but there were some very nefarious people there. And, you know, the evidence has shown that they were planning to do some things that were not correct. We know that. That's that's a known fact. Like hang Mike Pence. Right. Excuse me. Like yeah, hanging Mike well, Pence. Whatever. You know, no one's trying to justify that that I know of. So do you think that the House should investigate? In other words, if we don't have all the answers to all the questions that I'm asking, wouldn't a congressional investigation be the best way to get to the bottom of this? Well, you know, congressional investigations done correctly, no problem. Not One done, final question as, not, not, done as, not done as, you know, we want to get back at you, but done for looking for the truth. One final question before we let you go. Um, what is your proudest accomplishment when you were at HUD? What did you get done that you, you point to and say, that is the legacy of Ben Carson at HUD? Well, there's so many things. Uh, I don't worry a whole lot about legacies, but when I got there, there had not been an effective CFO for eight years. There had not been an audit of a major United States agency because there were so many material defects, it was impossible to do an audit. Uh, to be able to get that straightened out, to be able to bring our IT up to a, a point where we could do uh, real-time investigations of where money was going so that we could give more autonomy to the recipients, uh, the foster youth to independence program, because we had 20,000 young people aging out of foster care each year with no support, the Envision Centers so that we could coordinate the many services so that you could actually get people out of poverty, the Opportunity Zones leading that effort, which created 500,000 jobs and public-private partnerships so that things could uh, be elevated. Those were the things that really made a big difference. Uh, QR codes 
so that uh, homeless people could find shelter wherever they were, anywhere in the United States. You know, there there were a ton of things. You didn't hear a whole lot about okay. them, but because they were good things, there were a ton of things. And and I'm, I'm glad you had the opportunity to list them because you're right. A lot of times that when people like you do good things, they don't hear about them, but then they say things that people have questions about, like your comments at CPAC, and, and we talk about that at, at nauseum. So, Dr. Ben Carson, I want to thank you for joining us on D.C. today. We're Thanks, going to take a break. We'll be right back. Thank you.